thinking about some ways that we can be of service in the community and they came up with this day of service and so um, it's kind of organic and started as a fairly small thing and just grew and grew. One of the best ways that we can honor the life and legacy of Dr. King is to provide service to others. We really feel like on this day, yes, it's a holiday. Yes, there are some people who don't have to go to work, but it's very important for us to give back to our community. That is one of the greatest things we can do to honor his life, his legacy, and his memory. We really need to do something. And it started from just a few people wanting to do something to what happened today. The King holiday is um, you know, quite often used as a time to remember the man and what he did and what he stood for and the dream that he spoke so eloquently about um, and to spark in others of us uh, a desire to, um, to talk about justice, to fight for justice and all that. It's important, I think, for us to uh, as a community, as an entity here in Jackson to, to demonstrate and put our money and our time and our efforts where our words are um, in order to serve, but also as a model to young people, um, just helping them to understand that we can all do something. There's, there's more than enough work to go around, and so it's an opportunity for us to serve and to serve as a model for, other young, for our young people. Greetings to the entire Jackson Public Schools community. I'm Eric Green, your superintendent, and this is your monthly minute. Happy New Year, everyone. I really hope that you took the time to enjoy your winter break, to rest, to rejuvenate, took time with your families, and that you stopped, you paused for a moment just to count your many blessings. With all of the challenges and all the stressors and just all of the things that are going on in the world, I know it's hard sometimes to be reminded of those things that are going right, of the blessings that we do have and the ways that um, our lives are, are positive and are good. And it's important for us to do that intentionally, for all of us to do that, for us as adults, but also for our young people to be mindful of the things that are good in our lives and to value that and to remember that their lives have purpose. Every one of us is here on this earth for a purpose. One of my big purposes is to ensure that our organization, that our school district is successful, that each individual, that our young people, that our team members, that our families and communities, that we're all successful as a result of the things that we do on purpose. And so I'm excited for this next semester, this new opportunity for us to be uh, recommitted to our goals to remember the things that we said we would do at the start of the year, but to do them more intentionally, to bring the, the opportunities that we had to rest and the renewed energies and, and the vision and the, the heart and all those things, to bring those into this next semester. We have an opportunity to do some things that really have not been done. We have an opportunity to show this community and this world that there's greatness here in Jackson Public Schools, in Jackson, Mississippi, and we have yet to show them all that we can be. Let's do that. Let's do that. I'm committed to ensuring our success. I'm committed to getting better each and every day. I hope you are too. To all of our scholars, this is your opportunity to show and prove. This is your opportunity to show yourselves and the rest of the world that you have value, that you are brilliant, and that you are more than capable. And to all of our Team JPS members, you have what you need in order to meet with great success. Let's show ourselves and let's show the rest of this community, let's show the world what Jackson Public Schools is made of. We can do this and we can do it together. Don't forget, we are in fact one district, moving in one direction, marching towards excellence. Let's have a great month, a great semester, and let's meet the level of success that we set out to meet. Thank you, everyone. This is Eric Green with your Monthly Minute.
So every year, the Ladies Wears Junior League of Jackson uh, graciously collect uniform pants for our scholars' uh, uniform closet here at the Morrison Complex. We are grateful because our whole goal with everything we do here is to remove any obstacles or any issues that would uh, maybe just have the students thinking about something other than the academics. We believe that our scholars are important, they are our futures, and we want to um, eliminate any barriers that they may have in their daily life while they are in school. This is where the JLJ volunteers and members of the community are able to make donations directly to our community partners. This is actually our eighth year um, with Pile of Pants. This is one of the six um, jumble gifts that's happening this year. So this is one of the many gifts that we're going to be planning for the year. We have amazing scholars doing amazing things. Some of them need a little help every now and then and that's what we're here to do but we only are able to do it with help from our community partners. So we're grateful to the ladies of Junior League for providing us with over 500 pair of uniform pants this morning. Attention parents of all JPS scholars, the path to excellence in education begins when families and communities work together. And you're invited to take this journey with us by registering now for the Parent and Family Engagement Summit. Join us March 30th, 5.30 p.m. at Cardoza Middle School located at 3120 McDowell Road Extension in Jackson. This is your opportunity to discover test-taking strategy sessions, to learn about career opportunities, and to get tips about summer reading. The event includes a complimentary dinner and prizes. Your child deserves the best education possible. Register now before March 10th at jackson.k12.ms.us slash parent summit registration. We look forward to seeing you there. What's happening here in Jackson Public Schools? Can you feel it? We're all doing the work together and we're succeeding. Graduation rates are going up. We had to believe ourselves that we could do this. Students who score advanced went above and beyond. We celebrate the outstanding scholastic accomplishments of all of you scholars. One district. Heading in one direction. Marching towards excellence. I'm Larry Wilson from Northwest IB Middle School and I'm in seventh grade. I'm Allison Henson from Northwest Middle School and I'm in the seventh grade. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Laban Sensei, por favor. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Yo prometo lealtad a la bandera. Of the United States of America. De los Estados Unidos de América. And to the republic for which it stands. Y a la república que representa. One nation under God. Una nación bajo Dios. Indivisible. Indivisible. For liberty and justice for all. Con libertad y justicia para todos. You may be seated. Pueden sentarse. Hello, I'm Fatima Townsend, a proud senior at Jim Hill High School. I'm delighted to greet you today on this occasion of the 2023 Winter Convocation. A special thanks to Superintendent Dr. Green, the school board, administration, and my fellow scholars for giving me this opportunity. We began the school year marching towards excellence. Although our first semester was filled with water and HVAC challenges, we persevered and made it through the semester. We are now at the halfway mark of a wonderful school year. Our journey is not complete. We must continue to strive for excellence and finish the school year strong and better than ever. We are happy to be a C-rated school district, but not satisfied. We still have some growing to do. Why settle for good if greatness is still obtainable? I call on my fellow classmates and the 19,000 plus scholars across the district to lean in and finish strong, come to school, show up, strive for less than five absences this semester. You cannot learn if you are not at school or engaged with your classes. I challenge all of you, including myself, to do better this semester and to our teachers. Thank you for the long hours you put in with lesson planning and professional development. Thank you to our custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and everyone who plays a role in helping us succeed. In closing, I want to give a special shout out to Principal Bobby Brown and the wonderful staff at Jim Hill High School. We're the best, 
but better than the rest, we are the mighty, mighty Tigers. Have a productive day. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you from 601 Beasley Road at the home of the Callaway Chargers, it's the JTS 2023 Winter Convocation, a journey toward excellence. With your host, Superintendent Dr. Eric L. Green. Hello and Happy New Year to the entire Jackson Public Schools community. Welcome back. I hope that each of you have had an opportunity to enjoy your holiday break, to take some much needed time to rest, to refresh, and to enjoy time with your families and friends. We're excited to have you back as we kick off this second semester of this wonderful school year. Thank you also to our outstanding scholars, Larry Wilson and Allison Henson of Northwest Jackson Middle School for delivering our Pledge of Allegiance and to Fatima Townsend of Jim Hill High School for that wonderful greeting. We began this school year, ladies and gentlemen, with the theme, One District, One Direction, Marching Towards Excellence. Well, our journey is not yet complete. We still have many more months of marching to do. And today, I'm delighted to serve as your host of our talk show entitled, A Journey Towards Excellence. I'm joined today by scholar members of our Board of Trustees who will share their thoughts and ideas, their experiences as high schoolers here in Jackson Public Schools. Hey, my name is Jada Beasley, and as you know, I attend Callaway High School. Hey, my name is Willie Jones, and I attend Lanier High School. Good luck on the second half of the year. Happy New Year. I'm Terry Powell, and I attend Jim Hill High School. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a happy new year. My name is Emmanuel Edwards, and I attend Murrow High School. Hey, my name is Mariana Donald, and I attend Forest Hill High School. My name is Brandon Jones, and I attend Provine High School. Good luck on the second half. Hi, happy new year. I'm Azaria O'Quinn, attending Wingfield High School. Well, thank you to each of you for joining me today. I uh, just want to have a little bit of conversation. Uh, folks really want to know what you're thinking, what you've been up to, and so let's share a little bit of that. We'll start with this easy question. How's the year going? How's it going for you? We'll start here, Jada. So far, um, it's been a whirlwind, ups and downs, but it's going good so far. All right. This year, I've taken the leap I wanted to take, like as a junior to a senior. Everything that's going the way it's like I wanted to go, but I can. I'm strong enough to go through it. All right. For it. All right. You're working through the challenges. Yes, sir. So far, my year is going good. I feel like I've taken more of a control than I did last year. So far for me, this year has been a lot of trials and tribulations, but I've taken the steps necessary to become the person I want to be. Oh my, <laughs> <laughs> I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> Ms. O'Quinn? Uh, I can say personally for me, the year started off pretty rough with me um, losing my position as battalion commander, not running for Ms. Wingfield and doing the things that I wanted to do, but God has blessed me with this opportunity to be able to speak for my school and my district to help me march towards my excellence. I feel like my school year is going smooth due to my injury and stuff. I'm getting back better, getting back healthy. My school year is going all right. Last year was better. Well, listen, I want to dive into uh, one of the big topics that lots of people have been discussing over the last couple of years that we've kind of worked through this pandemic. Um, one thing that has really bubbled up and there's been lots of conversation, lots of kind of investigation and theories and all sorts of things is around mental health and especially the mental health of young people. I want to first ask, is that a real concern? Are you all concerned about mental health? The administrators should be concerned. I'm really not concerned because, wait, that's not me, but it don't have nothing to do with me, but I do feel for others. But like the administrators should be more responsible for it. Are you seeing more um, issues? Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Uh, board members, we have seven members present. We have Mrs. Johnson on the phone, and the rest of the board is here in the boardroom. We have all had, and therefore we have a quorum, we have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? I so move. Second. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Uh, next, we've all had an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the January 17, 2023 regular board meeting minutes? So moved. 
Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Uh, and now we're on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Good evening, board members, and to all of our JPS community members who are here with us or watching live stream or record it. Uh, we'll begin as we typically do with our um, video reel of all the latest happenings in Jackson Public Schools. Vision for excellence in performing arts comes to fruition at Forest Hill High School with new auditorium renovations, including seating, flooring, big screen, and state-of-the-art audio. And with our facility uh, department, uh, central office leaders, contractors, subcontractors, it really has been an all-hands-on-deck project. It definitely is a motivation for the community. We worked so hard to get these. We deserve these. So obviously, we need to stick it up and do what we start to do. Our district, we're here, and it's our time to let everybody know that we will compete with every school district in the state of Mississippi. Four principals honored as Divisional Principals of the Year, exhibiting core values of equity, excellence, growth, mindset, relationships, relevance, and a positive and respectful culture. Congratulations, Dr. Anthony Moore, KC Elementary, Principal of the Year at Division One. Delacy Bridges, McLeod Elementary, Principal of the Year, Division Two. Kevin Culver, Bailey APAC, and Northwest Middle, Principal of the Year, Middle School Division. And Dr. Shamika Sutton McClung, Callaway High, Principal of the Year, High School Division. Two JPS coaches emerge as outstanding leaders in high school and middle school athletics. Congratulations, Ashley Sutton, Callaway High School basketball coach, and Frank Sutton, Jr., Kirksey Middle School football and basketball coach. Tomorrow's 25, helping these amazing JPS coaches excel in athletic leadership. Plus, mark your calendar for two upcoming JPS events aimed at bringing parents, scholars, and schools together. First, the JPS English Learner and Parent and Community Spring Forum at Bates Elementary School, February 9th at 5.30 p.m. A great opportunity for our ELL families to learn valuable information for their scholars. Online registration for the Parent Family Engagement Summit at Cardoza Middle School on March 30th is now underway. Go to jackson.k12.ms.us slash parent summit registration. Join us as families, community, schools, and scholars work together to become more successful. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast Channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at www.youtube.com forward slash JPS ITV. Thank you, team, for um, that video. I appreciate your work on that. Uh, Jackson Public Schools joins the nation in celebrating our school counselors this week, which is National School Counseling Week. Uh, the, the theme for this year is School Counselors Helping Students Dream Big. Jackson Public Schools has 88 professionally educated school counselors. And as advocates, our school counselors identify and evaluate factors um, that affect our scholars' success. In addition, our school counselors support scholars' mental health by offering instruction that enhances awareness of mental health and um, appraisal and advisement, also addressing academic, career, and social-emotional development. Our counselors uphold the ethical and professional standards of the American School Counselor Association, which is ASCA, and lead it in developing school counseling programs based on the ASCA national model. As vital members of the school-based team, our counselors help to create a culture of excellence and success for all scholars. Please join me as we celebrate our wonderful school counselors and acknowledge all that they do to help ensure that our scholars succeed in school and in life.
And I don't know that we have any of our, do we have any of our school counselors in the house? Not here with us, but um, just definitely want to extend that, that thanks and appreciation to them this week and year round. Uh, board members, each year, as you know, and throughout the month of February, we pay special tribute to African American history and culture and contributions. Uh, I'm pleased to have one of our own board members, Mr. Frank Figures, to join us now and share just a tiny portion of that rich and important history, and especially as it, as it is situated here in Jackson and in the state of Mississippi. Mr. Figures. Thank you, Honorable Superintendent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. The Council of Federated Organizations was an unprecedented example and demonstration of unity and collaboration. This demonstration developed in the state of Mississippi because the people of the state of Mississippi recognized the need for consensus and collaboration. In the same way that the people's collaboration right here in Jackson, Mississippi, worked together to, pre to prevent a hostile takeover from the state of Mississippi of the Jackson Public School District the wealthiest public school district in the state. The Jackson Public School District was saved primarily because of a collaboration that existed between our JPS, Better Together Commission, neighborhood associations, the faith community, IDEA, teachers unions, and educational associations, as well as committed, concerned community stakeholders. This collaboration facilitated this administration, professionals and paraprofessionals, and allowed their genius to take a school district in five years from a consistent F to within striking distance of an A. The Council of Federated Organizations was a collaboration that people created and developed to transform the two-tiered segregated system of Mississippi to Mississippi's separate and unequal to one Mississippi, or at least the Mississippi that we have today. The Council of Federated Organizations collaboration did many things, and time doesn't permit me to name them all. However, Mrs. Donald, the administrative assistant to the Jackson Public School superintendent, gave me strict orders that for five minutes or less. So I'm just going to name two. One, the Council of Federated Organizations Collaborative was a demonstration that changed the state of Mississippi's narrative that people in Mississippi were satisfied with the conditions as they had existed since the late 1800s. This collaboration changed the state of Mississippi's sponsored, state-sponsored narrative that people were incapable, incompetent, and ill, uncaring, and unconcerned about the conditions that affect their everyday lives. The second thing is that another thing that the, that the COFO collaboration did was to create a space for the ingenuity, the intellect, the inter energy, the talent, and the resourcefulness of young people. How did this happen? The development of the COFO collaboration allowed college students from Jackson College, from Alcorn College, from Mississippi Valley State College, from Russ College, from Tougaloo College, from Campbell College, from Utica Institute, from the Southern Christian 
College, from Cahoma College, from Mary Holmes College, from Mississippi Industrial College, from Prentice Institute and Piney Woods to use what they had to do what they could where they were in order to bring about a fair deal and a better life for themselves and their posterity. But not only colleges and college students, but high school scholars also. High school students like the 45 who I have identified who were arrested in Jackson, Mississippi in 1961 for doing what Freedom Riders were coming to Jackson to do. Of that 45, 30 came from Lanier High School and its feeder pattern, including Hezekiah Watkins, who was identified uh, at the time as 13 years old, the youngest, and was sent to Parchman Penitentiary and placed on death row along with the other Freedom Riders. Now, COFO opened up the opportunity uh, for, young, for these young people who wanted to make and see change come and wanted a better life and a fair deal for themselves and their posterity. Please know that because of the COFO collaboration, the 30 Lanier High School scholars who have been identified as freedom riders 21 evolved into full-time freedom workers. Mm -hmm. In a speech given by Miss Ella Baker entitled Bigger Than a Hamburger in 1960, young people were inspired to dedicate their time, their talents, and their resources to work on making two Mississippis one Mississippi, or at least the Mississippi that we have today. Now, I'm just going to name a few that transition from freedom rider to freedom worker. Eugene Lee, Jimmy Travis, George Lowe, Robert Bass, Robert Lee Green, Jesse Harris, Colia Liddell, Julie, Julene Austin, Dolores Lynch, Ralph Floyd, Charles McLaurin, LaVon Brown, James Pittman, Charles Harris. There were many, many more. There were four segregated high schools in Jackson in 1962. They were Lanier High School, Brinkley High School, Jim Hill High School, and Holy Ghost High School. Dr. Amos Brown, pastor of the Third Baptist Church of San Francisco, California, the church where Vice President of the United States of America, Ms. Kamala Harris, attends and have been attending for the last 20 years, went to Jim Hill, but was not allowed to graduate, but expelled because of his activism. Mm -hmm. Today, with Jackson Public Schools, there exists a Good Apple Award that is sponsored by none other than, Lene than Jim Hill former student, Dr. Amos Brown. In addition, Judge Henry T. Wingate, federal Southern District Judge, who was at one time the roommate to former President Bill Clinton uh, and was appointed by President Clinton to that position, a student activist from Brinkley High School, led a massive demonstration right here in Jackson when nearly 3,500 students and people were arrested and placed in a makeshift jail and concentration-like camp in the livestock pavilion of the Jackson State Fairgrounds. The release of those involved in that demonstration was facilitated uh, because of the Council of Federated Organization. I note here that over 450 scholars that were arrested during that weekend came from Lanier High School, and that 450 is just a one-day total on a Friday afternoon in May from Lanier High School. Now, I claim no special distinction or exemption for the scholars from the Lanier High School and their feeder pattern. They only represent the goals, 
aspirations, values, determination, and ideals of a community seeking a better life and a fair deal, a world that would hold all of God's people, all of the Adams and all of the Eves and all of their countless generations. Now, um, I'm chuckling to myself because uh, there was a, a point at time not too, too long ago that I thought I was going to do this, <laughs> that, that I was planning to just share a little bit of history. And it dawned on me, and I will call it the spirit moving or whatever, that mm, there are those better positioned to do this, who've lived a bit of this. Thank you so much, Mr. Figures, for one, just being so willing, always at the ready, with um, t t tons of, uh, of history, of connections, um, of lived experiences and relationships. Um, and we're just so blessed to have you mm -hmm. on this board, in our midst, someone that we can touch and talk to and engage with um, and learn from. And thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm sitting here saying, geez, we should be doing this so much more than just in this month. So, you know, be prepared. <laughs> be prepared. Bring, bring your lemons. We're going to have you speaking a little more <laughs> on some of this history. Thank you so much, sir. And Dr. Sivak, with that, I turn the meeting back over to your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you, Mr. Figures. Um, we're just so blessed to have you share mm -hmm. your knowledge, intellect, wisdom, and self with all of us. Um, we will now move on to um, public participation in public comments. I don't believe we have any comments. Is that correct? Great. Well, I'll just, um, there, there are no comments tonight, but I will just remind uh, the community that um, anyone who would like to make public comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 on the day of the meeting. And now we have our school board representative presentation. So I'll invite Mrs. Marshall Thomas up to introduce our school board representative from Wingfield. Great evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Our board policy highlight um, will be presented by Azaria O'Quinn. Azaria is a senior at Wingfield High School. Um, Azaria plans to attend Jackson State University and major in business and entrepreneurship. Um, she's currently enrolled in our cosmetology program at CDC, and she's a member of the band where she plays the cymbals. Azario Quinn. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Azario Quinn from Wingfield High School, and I'm the student school board representative. Today I'll be discussing poli policy JKAD, which is student safety with a focus on safety drills. Background and context include, are safety drills implemented with fidelity in all schools, and do these drills contribute to students' feelings of being safe or unsafe in schools? Board policy JKADD student safety drills. Each school shall have a current disaster plan and shall conduct regular safety drills to include, but not limited to, bomb threat, earthquake, fire, and tornado. It shall be the duty of the principals and teachers in all school buildings to instruct the pupils in the methods of fire drills and practice fire drills until all the pupils in the school are familiar with the methods of escape. Such fire drills shall be conducted enough to keep the Keep such pupils well drilled. It shall be the further duty of such pr principals and teachers to instruct the pupils in all programs of further emergency management as may be designed by the State Department of Education. <coughs> 
Board Policy EBAB, Section 4, Active Shooter. Each school will conduct an active shooter drill within the first 60 days of each new school semester. In addition, all district personnel will participate in the an annual active shooter response training. Um, board Policy to JKAD and EBAB. Upon first glance at these policies, I was unaware that the school had a policy for intruder drills. However, in light of recent school events, I felt a policy should include intruder drills. As I began my research, I found that one teacher in, her, in, in the building had a crisis response kit in her room that had specific details on how to handle intruders. So I began looking at other classes to see if any of these other teachers had this kit. Unfortunately, 39 of our classrooms did not have this crisis response kit. This also led to the discovery that the school has a safety and plan for intruders. I met with my school principal and assistant principals about this plan. From this meeting, I learned that specific teachers in the building have particular roles if an intruder comes into the building. I also learned that the school's last intruder drill was on September 27th of 2022, lasting for 11 minutes from 1230 to 1241. Another intruder drill is scheduled for some time in the second semester. From this meeting, we agreed that there should be some revisions to the school and district policy slash procedures for intruder drills. Recommended policy revisions or procedures include campus enforcement should update the crisis response kit yearly. Teachers should be given a crisis response kit at the start of each school year. School staff be adequately trained by trained district staff on their roles during the crisis drill. Students, chosen students, should be adequately trained in situations where the staff are unable to carry out the procedures or if there is untrained, an untrained substitute and JPS or schools should develop an app to help communicate among staffs and students during the actual intruder or active shooter situations with varying levels of authorization so that only specific people can make certain calls and certain actions for monitoring and ensuring clear communications to all stakeholders. In conclusion, safety is important. I was happy to learn that there is a policy for intruders in the building. As students, we often don't understand why specific policies and procedures are done, but ultimately it's to protect our health and safety. Students will feel more safer at school with more drills, communication about why these drills are done. I look forward to, to further conversations about the recommendations. Thank you, Ms. O'Quinn. Uh, board members, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I have a great presentation, great presentation, but I have a question about the kits. What's in the kits, and why did only one teacher have it? Is it standard issue, or? Um, it's supposed to be issued to all teachers at the beginning of the year. I'm very glad that you asked about what's in this kit. Um, I brought it with me. Great. So in this kit, you have the front paper that you see on the front says, Crisis Response Kit Instructions, which are instructions on what to do if any of this, the crisis response, or the crisis in this packet that they have, what procedures to follow, the basic procedures to follow. This packet lists all, like any possible thing that could happen at the school and what to do. A lot of the um, teachers who had a crisis, like this bag in their room, did not have this packet. So even if something was to happen, we wouldn't, they wouldn't know what specifically to do because it was not in the packet. Um, there are two sets of red, yellow, and green paper, um, and those are for indication to indicate um, red if it's imminent danger or injuries, yellow, immediate, no immediate threat, possible injuries, and, but not life-threatening, and green, all clear, no injuries. Um, it includes a zip tie and two markers for the number of students you have in your classroom written on the, uh, on the paper. Um, there's two sets because one is supposed to go on the external window and one is supposed to go under the door. But after speaking with the principals, we ruled that it's very unsafe to slip the paper under the door because we wouldn't know if the intruder drill is over or if the intruder is outside of the building. So slipping the paper under the door would let them know where we are if they had not already been in that room. This is so interesting. <laughs> And so the, um, you said one teacher had it, the rest of them, the other 39 did not. So 39 of them didn't, but I went around with um, the campus enforcement um, officer that we have, and I think we counted, I think, 64 classrooms that were actually occupied. 
and um, that we will get to be safe 75 more of these kits updated. Who, um, who does the kits? Where do they come from? Campus now? enforcement. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your uh, your presentation, and I know the policy committee, I've already asked uh, Ms. Williams to be sure that all of these recommendations that we receive from our students, that we keep up with them and prioritize them on our policy committee. So thank you so much for, and all of the students, for helping us see what needs to be done through the eyes of our students. Yes, thank, thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Council? Dr. Lyon? Was there something in particular that inspired you to take on these policies? <laughs> um, just because safety is important and in order to be able to learn and feel comfortable to learn, I need to feel safe. If I'm not safe somewhere, then I won't be as acceptance to what's surrounding, what's being given to me if I'm not safe. So I wanted to ensure, well, from a student's perspective and from a teacher perspective as well, because teachers and administration um, safety is just as important as student safety. And so I wanted to see, well, where should I start to getting them to the safest, you know, to lead away for the next person or, you know, with the help of you guys to make everybody safe. Just anecdotally, I'm wondering how you feel in your school now. Do you feel particularly safe, or how do you feel like about the environment in school? Um, We've had this conversation as a board in recent months. Necessarily, I do not feel safe completely because, of course, there's things that have happened, and who's to say that it won't happen again? So I cannot say I'm 100% safe at my school. Thank you. I appreciate you being honest. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation, and thank you so much for bringing things to our attention that we really need to look at. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just real curious because you know that's your one school, but like even all the other schools. So this kit, all teachers in all classrooms at all schools are supposed to have. Yes, ma'am. I believe so. And they so. have a training or something that lets them know how to use that? Do, you, do we know that? I'm going to ask one of my team members to speak to the kids. Somebody, please. <laughs> So yes, all, all classrooms are required to have the um, crisis response kits. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, so when these were first given out, they, were, they are to remain in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So what we found out as a result of Azaria's research is when new teachers leave and they clean up their rooms, they've been discarding the entire kits in the process of cleaning up their rooms. Mm -hmm. And so we have already um, began the process of ensuring that all of the high schools have replacement kits. These were provided for all classrooms, but again, as staff turnover each year, these um, kits have been somehow misplaced. Yeah, so I'm just like wondering, like even if, as, if I'm a new teacher in JPS and I go to my classroom, is there something in my training yes. or orientation that yes. lets me know I should be looking for that kit? So we have a, we have a crisis response um, binder. At the beginning of each school year, schools are required to train staff. So they take maybe three or four hours at the beginning of the school year to go through the entire crisis response protocol. Where are the reunification points? You know, who do you contact? Who is your lead on your hall? All of that is spelled out in each school's kit throughout the school year. So for example, when we return in January, the part of the professional development is geared to, okay, what are second semester drills that are coming up? What are some things we need to revisit? What are some things that we've seen in the last semester that didn't go well? It could be a, a, a something as simple as a fire drill. One thing we noticed, so we had a conversation this week. We had a fire drill and our students had never um, left the cafeteria during a fire drill, so they didn't know where to go. They were always either doing the first block or second block. And so one thing that we realized, 
we need to have drills in different blocks so that students will know exactly where the locations are in each period. So those kinds of things we go through and as we, you know, we learn and, and, and learn more things, we, you know, we do better. Thank you. Clearly, this is something that we've got to fix. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I need to state it, but I will. Um, this will be addressed. But this is the floor, as, you know, as Dr. Harrison alluded to this, you know, additional consideration via policy, but just based on policy and procedures that we have in place, let's make sure that those are being followed. Um, and so, unfortunately, we're finding out in this way, but we're finding out. I think it's great, though, actually, because yeah. especially from our students, I mean, because you all are there. You, we're not in your buildings every day. And so for you to bring this forth um, and to have done the research to, to bring it to light, to shed the light on it, because we don't know. We can't clean in a dark corner, and we don't know what's in there. Now we know what's in there, and now we get an opportunity to fix it before something happens. So thank you for your work. That was really great. I have one, one, one last question, and I just echo all of the um, um, praise for the, the work that you've done here. Um, and I really believe that this work makes us better as a district um, and want to lift that up. Do you know um, within the policy, is there an audit function? So what I mean by that is, does the policy say that classrooms should be checked annually for the presence of the kit? Um. When I was speaking with the principals, they, um, with uh, Mr. Roderick Smith, uh, my principal, he said that uh, st that campus enforcement would come around and they would check and see if the classrooms had it. But I'm not sure if, if something could have been going on that day and they could, it could not have been their fault that they did not do a thorough check. So I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. It's just something for a consideration as we think of, of policy. Should it actually be the, the um, review be in policy? We could obviously have procedures and you know that could function that way as well. Um, but again, Dr. Harrison, I'm looking at you as chair of the policy committee of things to consider as we take into the, rec the recommendations and the considerations. Um, so thank you, Ms. O'Quinn. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, let's give her a hand of applause. Um, next, we will move on to our bond update. I'll invite uh, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Franklin uh, to um, give us the latest update. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we haven't seen each other since December since there wasn't a first board meeting in January. So we, uh, at the first board, board meeting of each month, we do have the pleasure of providing the bond update. Dr. Seebeck, board president, um, Dr. Green. And tonight's presentation, to the next one. She's so great. She saved me. <laughs> All right. So tonight's presentation, we're going to have the pleasure of actually giving a recap of the bond, um, where we have gone um, since the inception to where we are now, and also give a bond financial report update. And tonight's presentation, Ms. Franklin is going to give the entire presentation, and I will come up for any questions. Ms. Franklin. Good evening, board members. Um, like Ms. Robinson said, we're kind of um, going to approach it differently tonight, and we'll look at an overview of um, where we are on our completed projects. Um, but first, uh, let's start uh, from the beginning. And remember kind of where we started, um, the state of our restrooms, uh, doors, flooring in a lot of our buildings, um, leaky roofs. Um, a lot of the plumbing inside of our walls had rusted and corroded uh, and fixtures wouldn't even stay on the wall. But uh, with the $65 million bond referendum, we've been able to address uh, much of that. Uh, let's uh, start at our elementary schools. And I think these are um, kind of uh, projects that made the most impact for our scholars. We were, we've been able to 
renovate multiple restrooms at 17 of our elementary schools. Here we're only looking at photos of um, a few of them. Uh, at Boyd, Clausell, and Dawson, we've been able to renovate one set of boys and girls restrooms at that school. At Green and Lake Elementary, we've been able to renovate two sets of boys and girls restrooms. And at Marshall and North Jackson Elementary, we've been able to renovate um, three sets, three sets at North Jackson and two at Marshall. And here are the remainder of those 17 uh, elementary school restrooms. At Oak Forest, it's been two sets of student restrooms. At Rains Elementary, we've done two sets of boys and girls restrooms. At Shirley, one set. And Smith and Walton have three sets of restrooms that have been renovated. Uh, some additional improvements that we've been able to make at our elementary schools include uh, the classroom toilets and also upgrading uh, the millwork and sinks in our, uh, many of our classrooms. Much of the millwork there had experienced termite damage or water damage over the years from just some of the leaky faucets. Uh, we were able to go in and do plumbing repairs inside the walls, uh, replace the cabinets, um, also update the countertops to solid surface and replace those sinks. Uh, at our middle schools, we've been able to do restroom renovations in three middle schools. At Brinkley, we've renovated two sets of student restrooms. At Chastain, we've renovated three sets of student restrooms. And at Powell, we've renovated four sets of student restrooms. And these are just some of our um, finished photos. Um, and at our high schools, we've actually been able to renovate multiple sets of restrooms at every single high school including Capital City and Career Development Center. And like I said, these are just uh, photos of a few. Some of the other replacements that we've done, we've been able to remove carpet and asbestos at several schools. Uh, Green Elementary, we were able to take out the carpet in all of those classrooms, as well as the um, hallways. And in some of these buildings, the carpet had been original to that building, which means it, <laughs> may have been 40 or 50 years old. Um, at Oak Forest, we were able to remove asbestos flooring throughout the hallways and replace with updated vinyl flooring. At North Jackson, uh, that's another one where we took up carpet in every single classroom and hallway. At Van Winkle, we did the same thing, replaced carpet in every pod and classroom as well as the library. At Chastain, we were able to remove carpet in seven of our technology labs. And at Northwest Middle School, we were able to remove all the carpet in those classrooms, uh, the hallways, and we also updated the lobby flooring to match the new vinyl flooring. Uh, some of the um, other exterior projects that we were able to do, and it also satisfied some of our MDE <coughs> corrective action plan at Boyd Elementary School and Callaway. Uh, in several classrooms at Boyd, we were able to replace windows and also provide an egress window which we didn't have previously. At Callaway High School in the uh, A building, we were able to renovate all of those windows and provide an egress window, as well as uh, we also provided new windows in the B building. Um, at Chastain Middle School, we were able to replace all of the windows in the sixth grade building. These windows were wood windows that had just deteriorated over time and were leaky. At Brinkley Middle School, we've been able to replace all except one elevation of windows at Brinkley Middle School. And at Hardy uh, Middle School, we've been able to replace all of those windows and really completely transform the look of that building. Um, two other really significant uh, projects that we've been able to do um, were roof replacements. Um, the cost for these were significant, like I said, in comparison to the amount of schools we have, uh, being able to do complete uh, re-roof at Witten Middle School and Callaway High School, um, it made a huge impact for both of these. Um, each project was about $2 million for each roof. Uh, some of the other significant upgrades, um, we may not see these just as we're walking through the school, but they do make impact. At Callaway High School, we were able to do a full HVAC renovation, which included all new fan coil units in every classroom, new chillers, uh, two new chillers, four boilers, new switch gear, and multiple transformers. 
uh, some of the limited upgrades that we were able to do at Baker and Key Elementary, we were able to replace uh, multiple electrical panels. At Brinkley Middle School, we replaced their main electrical panel as well as um, updated the fan coil units in the science labs. At Northwest Middle School, we were able to replace eight rooftop units there. And at Forest Hill High School, we were able to replace package units in the Coliseum, as well as um, individual um, heating and cooling units in our science labs. Um, also, throughout the district, we've been able to do numerous lighting upgrades, and that includes interior and exterior. Um, here we're just looking at photos of the exterior lighting projects, and those are all listed on the left. Um, we see here um, the canopy at Oak Forest. Um, we were able to upgrade that lighting. Uh, the entire block at Callaway, uh, the perimeter of the building, as well as the block that extends around North Jackson, we were able to do all new um, exterior lighting there. Uh, the entire perimeter of Lanier got new lights, as well as the entryway. And we were also able to relamp the student parking lot at Wingfield. Uh, another uh, significant type of progress uh, projects that we've been able to do included structural and uh, drainage upgrades. Uh, you may have noticed, um, you know, we've had standing water on, on our campuses. Um, so we've been able to address uh, repairing a lot of catch basins, uh, storm drains, for instance, at Isabel Elementary School, uh, in the crawl space at Johnson and Bailey, we were able to go under the crawl space repair several pylons that had cracked and shifted just due to um, di differential ground movement over time. At Oak Forest Elementary, we were able to install uh, storm drains to carry the roof water so that that courtyard doesn't flood anymore. At Capital City and Kirksey, we were able to install new storm drains to carry the water away from the building where it had been going you know, towards the building. Also, some additional exterior projects that we've been able to do. Um, at Green Elementary, we were able to add about 25 parking spaces for our teachers and staff. At John Hopkins here, uh, we were able to um, repave the, both entrances and the bus loop and parking around the building. At Van Winkle, we were able to repave that bus parking lot at the back of the school. At Timberline Elementary, we were able to repave the uh, visitor and teacher parking lot. At Jim Hill, we were able to repave the uh, entrance and back parking lot to the school. At Lanier, we were able to repair a storm drain that had failed um, at the GROTC parking lot. We were able to repair that and also repave that parking lot. At Powell Middle School, we've been able to repave the bus loop as well as the teacher parking. Uh, moving on to some more exciting projects, um, at um, three of our high schools, we were able to renovate gyms there. At Callaway, it received all new wood floors, updated LED lighting. Uh, this gym was also also received air conditioning, um, and we they also got new bleachers. At Forest Hill, the Coliseum, it received probably the I'm sorry probably the um, most renovations at the Coliseum, new maple wood flooring. Uh, updated uh, seating, the locker rooms were renovated, as well as the restrooms. It got a new four-sided uh, scoreboard. Um, it also got air conditioning and heating. At Jim Hill, we were able to replace the floors there and provide new telescoping bleachers. It's not yet uh, cooled, but it will be with our ESSER funds. And moving, moving on to one of our other projects, uh, you, you've seen it earlier tonight, um, our performing arts space at Forest Hill. And this was a renovation to the approximately 500 seat auditorium at Forest Hill. We got new stage lighting, uh, updated um, stage and audience lighting, new seating, a 24 foot uh, projection screen. Um, the stage was prepa uh, repaired. Um, the project also included renovating the band hall and two art classrooms. Um, next, we'll take a look at uh, the financials. And to date, all of those projects have cost us about $62.7 million, which is about 86% of our bond funds. 
and that's up from 81 percent that we um, showed in the December report. And still encumbered, we have about $6.3 million, and that's to, uh, for projects that are still, we're kind of in the closing out phase. And still unencumbered for remaining projects, we have about $3.5 million. Um, these next three slides just give an overview of everything that's been spent at each school site. And so um, that concludes the report. Like I say, it's just an overview of where we are uh, to the date with all of our bond projects. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. Board members, are there any questions, mm -hmm. comments? Good news. Mm -hmm. Good news. <laughs> I do, I do have one question that is actually not bond related, but is facility related. Um, we obviously heard news of some challenges at Forest Hill High School over the past week. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we ask questions as a board of um, what's the status of Forest Hill um, and any insights onto what happened, uh, were any of the um, uh, equipment that we purchased through the bond was was that affected any any news would be helpful okay. so <clears throat> excuse me so the the uh, material the equipment for the um, building was separate from anything we purchased new for the bond so the Coliseum received a new HVAC system but uh, the infra the the equipment in the main building um, as far as the mechanical room was was not you know purchased recently with the bond so the boiler it's some kind of way the inside fried. All the wiring and the control wiring for the boiler um, was no longer usable. And what failed, and so the boiler itself could not heat the building. We were able to locate a rental unit in Mobile, Alabama, that was um, transported here over Thursday night, uh, Friday morning, and installed Friday and over the weekend. And so the, the building did have heat beginning on Saturday, and the students were able to return on Monday. So we are looking at whether we can purchase a new control panel um, and wiring for the existing boiler or, or buy a new one. Um, so we're looking at those two options. But right now we do have a rental in place that's uh, functioning for the school. Okay. Do we know, and, and my sense is that it, it may be a while before the permanent fix is implemented. Is that correct? Um, we were looking if it if the control board is an option, um, the contractor is still evaluating. That's a three week lead time because chips are still a long lead time. And if it, a new boiler was required, it, that could take uh, at least eight weeks. Okay. And does that affect uh, air conditioning or is it just heat? Um, it affects both because you need some heating water in the school even when you run the air. So as long as we have the rental, um, so we have the rental as long as we need it. And so with that, both the air and the heat will work. Ms. Robinson, with, please yes. explain the rental, what it is. Explain what we rented. Okay, so we rented a boiler. So we, um, so the boiler itself, we couldn't purchase it because companies, um, I guess, you know, make money from rentals. Um, because it's a, um, not one that we could have purchased for this company, but they did ship in a, bo a boiler to, for the boiler that is not in service. So, so it's not a it's not a, a temporary, like a heater. It is a, an actual boiler. Oh. Is the thing that I wanted to make sure you all understood, um, such that it can be used to your question. It can be used to provide the heated water for the air conditioning units, right? It's not bypassing the boiler to heat. It's temporary boiler system. So, so effectively, it, it's a. It, it's the same piece of equipment, um, but we didn't take take it out. We couldn't like uh, disconnect the one that we have because we couldn't purchase it because this company, you know, actually provides um, rental equipment for emergency purposes. It makes sense. And, and, and as far as we know, we don't, we don't anticipate this temporary solution. This this should get us to the end of the school year. It's, that's not to say there may not be other things, but this if if we need to go to the end of the school year. Or so either we're looking at the, the three week for, with the new control board or six week with the, a new boiler. So we wouldn't have to do the rental for the entire remainder of the 
of the school year, but by the end of this week, we'll know whether the control board replacement for the existing boiler would be the option or if we start preparing to purchase a new boiler to see which one is best. But either way, we have the option of renting this temporary for the source for as long as we need it. Yes, sir. That's more of my question. I, I'm actually, the genesis of my question is more around making sure we can have students in the building. And it sounds like the solution that we have um, it's is, is, the, is the best. It, it sounds like we've got that covered. Yes, it's we do have here. that covered. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. And always great to see the wonderful photos of the new spaces. Thank you. All right. Next, um, board members, this uh, initially was not on the board agenda, um, uh, but Dr. Green, I think he was going to initially have it as part of the superintendent's report, but it rose to just we wanted to have this on the agenda. So we got information on our historical charter school payments. So Mr. Burke is going to walk us through this information. Uh, Dr. Green, I would ask, can you email this to board members as well? Because I know Ms. Johnson, it's already been emailed. It has been. I gave you all a copy. Hard copy. I know, but Mrs. Johnson, I just want to make sure she gets a copy. Good, good point. I just want to make sure Mrs. Johnson gets a copy. And, and just for clarity, um, we, uh, I had intended for Mr. Burke to speak to this in his monthly financials. Um, uh, reporting, but since this is the off meeting from the financials reporting, I didn't want to wait. Okay. So thank you. Fine. Yeah. Mr. Burke. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Good evening, uh, board, President Sevac, Superintendent Green. Uh, this uh, item is being offered uh, for information uh, about our current and historical charter school payments. Um, in compliance with Mississippi Code 3728-55, Jackson Public Schools must pay directly to each charter school uh, an amount for each student enrolled in that charter school equal to the ad valorem tax revenues and the any in lieu payments received per student for the support of local school district, for the local school district in which the student resides. Payments under this section must be made before the expiration of three business days after the funds are distributed to the school district by the tax collector. These are legislatively mandated payments and do not um, require board approval or ratification, but are presented for board information. Um, to provide some context uh, and to remind us of where we are in this, I prepared this for Dr. Green and he wanted me to share it with the board. Uh, going back to the origination of our, the charter school, presence of charter schools in the Jackson Public School District, initially we started with two and we are now uh, have a total of six. The payment amount has uh, increased from initially $595,000 to over $9 million. Uh, this represents um, going from 227 students across those two schools to uh, a little over 2,400 students. Um, the graph represents that increase, and I just thought it'd be helpful for you as board members to have that context. Um, Thank you, Mr. Burke. Board members, are there questions, comments? These, these payments have been made. As I said, they did not require ratification. Um, so they were issued um, January 13th. Between January 13th and January 18th, representatives from each one of the schools came and personally picked up their check. So. <laughs> yeah, so I got to, got to shake a few of their hands. And, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Burke, this, you don't have to answer. I, I have a question. Go ahead, go ahead Mrs. Johnson. Um, so given the data that we've had for all of these years, are we able to make projections as to what we'll be looking at two, three, four, five years from now? Um, we can make some projections. I don't, I'm, it'll just depend on, um, again, Dr. Cormack, Dr. Green, and I have had some conversations uh, related to um, new additional charter schools. I know with us being a C, uh, the, the law um, says that no new charter schools can be chartered, but looking at, we'd have to go back and review those original charters, I believe, to see if what those grades levels are uh, in, those, uh, in those schools that are already there. So right now, uh, there are two factors that, that, that uh, impact this. One is our Avalorum tax collections. That's the top line. 
depends on how much money we get in in terms of Avalorum and then how many students uh, that they have enrolled. Those are the two key components to this, along with the per pupil uh, local support amount. So that is based on our enrollment of our students. So if our trend in enrollment turns around, that, that per pupil goes down, if that, if I, um, and, uh, and hopefully those students will come back to us. As they continue to grow, we still have um, some challenges there. So we can make some estimates. Uh, we know it's growing. I mean, we can, we can figure out a percentage of growth. How accurate that uh, shakes out to be will just be dependent upon participation in charter schools and in our schools. And, and uh, Attorney Johnson also, you know, obviously to the extent that we're in communication with those charter operators and understand their plans for growing grade levels, for expanding grade levels, more scholars in kindergarten, more scholars in first grade or whatever, um, through those communications with them, we're able to better anticipate um, what those payments are likely to look like going forward. But, but you know, this definitely helps us to, to uh, forecast out. It's just not an exact science. Thank you. I've got one more question. Um, so are we, con are we um, have we created our own campaign to increase enrollment? Is, is that even, um, I mean, realistically, can we, is that possible? Is it just the trend that, you know, districts like ours are facing? So, so it's both and. Yes, districts are facing this, in, in, especially in urban, you know, areas where you're more likely to find charter schools. Um, but the answer to the, the um, original question, um, our team is already in the midst of planning for our enrollment season, um, incentives around enrollment. Um, you know, uh, support, uh, obviously communications and, and bigger, bolder communications around that, but also just rethinking our processes and how we support schools. Our effort, I can tell you now, our effort this year will be to get a certain percentage, at least, of our scholars who uh, we expect to re-enroll, re-enrolled by the end of the school year or before the end of the school year while we still have easier access to them. Um, so there's definitely some uh, more strategic planning um, and efforts around how we recapture our scholars and, and um, well, how we, how we get our scholars re-enrolled, um, let alone how we recapture those who may be in other places right now and are looking to come back with us. That to include um, making sure that we highlight more some of the programming that we have that folks are just not likely to find in, in other school settings. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, board members? Just a comment, uh, uh, President. I'd really like to thank Dr. Green for having the administration prepare excuse me mr figures can you use the mic i'm sorry uh, i say i just really want to thank superintendent green uh for having the administration prepare a report that this that's this easy on the eye my <laughs> estimate is that uh it took some time to so, do that so thank you i i appreciate that but i need to be really clear I, I asked for charter payments. What I received from Mr. Burke was this. And, and I told him this when we checked in uh, earlier today. Uh, it far exceeded my ask. Um, and he's consistently doing this. So I just appreciate, one, how he shows out with his little graphs and things. <laughs> Yo, he shows out with his graphs and tables and things, but also um, more and more how he's anticipating the questions um, and supporting us and thinking more strategically about decisions that will have to be made. So thank you, and I pass it right on to Mr. Burke. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Do we have any indication that 
any of our students are coming back? So, so yes, it happens. Um, and the, 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 the question is how, where, how well we're tracking any trends around that because it happens, but it goes both ways. And, and as you, you probably know, our scholars also move between our schools. So between us and our charters and between our schools, um, I'll ask Mr. Uh, or Dr. Merritt and his team um, if there's some way for us to track and, and share any trends, likely by a particular point in time. By this point in time, we've seen X number go out and X number come in. It's probably easier for us, and I don't know, uh, it's probably easier for us to name where those who've come to us in the middle of the year, where they came from, and less so those going out because we don't always get the requests for records. But I'll, I'll see if, um, I'll, I'll ask the team to take that note and, and um, we can figure out what, what kinds of information we can share with you on that. What's the highest grades that these charters go to? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay. Eighth grade. And so are we getting them back in high school or are they going, okay. That's, yeah. Hopefully we're getting them back for high school. Yes, I mean, uh, there again, I mean, we need to figure out what shrinkage, so to speak, do we experience even coming out of high school, are all of them that leave us middle school go to charters, then coming back in high school? Likely, but, but are they then further disappearing out into other districts or what have you? That's something that I think, too, we need to be able to more, more readily respond to. We lost, you know, call it 10% of our scholars in middle school did we gain that number or percentage of scholars back in ninth grade? And I, I'd also be curious to know if they're just coming back to their regular district school or trying to go into our special right. programming. We'll, we'll see what digging we can, we can do on that. that. That's a great question. Do we have all those questions? Okay. I, I have one more. Is there a high school charter school that's been authorized that has not been executed yet that is a potential risk mm. i'm seeing there is yes okay mm -hmm. there is is there a timetable by which they have to open or if they don't it, it's 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 in perpetuity <laughs> we've, we've had some of these conversations yeah, yeah. good evening so um no charter, a charter high school was previously authorized. It was authorized pre-pandemic uh, with a date for it to open in the fall. When it did not open, there is nothing in its charter indicating when, um, if, if they would have to be reauthorized, those issues would likely need to be litigated to uh, ascertain clarity about exactly where that stands. Because currently, with our C-rated status, um, I believe we would contend that they would need to um, be reauthorized because they did not open for when they were authorized to open. And, and, and given our status, as you all understand, would, that would need to come through this board as well for your voice on whether or not that should happen. I'm confident we'd be ready for that. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I've got one more question. Yes, Mrs. Um, Johnson. Do we know what our loss is in terms of when students return but the funds um, are not following them? Um, we can calculate that. I, I, I don't, I think there's, there's a, a general loss of there are scholars that we get at a certain, after a certain point in the school year, and we're serving them, but we didn't get the funding in the school year for them. Um, and then there's whatever cut of that is attributed to scholars coming from charter schools back to us. 
and not all scholars who come to us mid-year are coming from charters. Um, I don't know the extent to which. I am, I'm assuming we can isolate for that, though, right? That we can isolate for uh, or to determine based on those we know who are coming from a charter school, how many are coming after a particular date in which we would not be um, provided any funding for them. We'll work on um, pulling information and, and trying to package that in a way that's helpful to you all. And, and I'll let you know as, um, when you can expect some reporting on that as quickly as possible. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Dr. Green, for adding that to the agenda. Um, and thank you, Mr. Burke, for the, for the information. I now invite uh, Amanda Thomas, Ms. Amanda Thomas, up to um, our Executive Director of Climate and Wellness to present the review of the renewal agreement between Smiles to Go and Jackson Public School District. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Seebeck, President, Board Members, Dr. Green, Superintendent. The administration presents to you as an information item approved, well, a review of the memorandum of agreement between Jackson Public Schools and Smiles to Go. The purpose of this agreement is to continue the established and guided working relationship between Smiles to Go and Jackson Public School District. Smiles to Go will continue to provide on-site mobile dental services to students at nine school sites. Um, this, during the previous contract period, a total of 1,875 services have been provided to 350 scholars. These services include student examinations, fluoride, treatments, prevention salience, x-rays, cleanings, cavities, repair, as well as referral to specialists. Great. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Board members, any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. All right. Next, we will um, invite Dr. Cormick up to um, provide a review of the 2023-2024 academic calendar. Good evening, Dr. Seebeck, Dr. Green, members of the board, and our JPS team and family. The administration recommends that the board approve the 2023-2024 academic calendar for students, instructional staff, and other certified staff members. Uh, each year, the district must set a calendar for students and certified staff members. Um, we participated again in the Greater Jackson Chamber Partnership, which is a common school calendar committee for metro area K-12 um, institutions, colleges, and universities. The administration has included professional development hours each month, which um, are achieved with um, at least one early release day per month. As well, this year we are utilizing or proposing to utilize ESSER professional development funds to add five additional teacher professional development dates, uh, which would also be inclusive of all instructional staff, both certified and classified staff. Uh, these days are vital to supporting our curriculum review and development, unit and lesson planning, and academic content development and support. As well, this calendar maintains the shift of our fall break to coincide with the Friday of JSU homecoming, uh, which um, has now been slated for October 14th, and so our date will be for fall break October 13th, followed by a teacher, a parent-teacher conference day the following Monday. Uh, this format was very successful um, during this year at reducing absences uh, around the homecoming calendar, and we urge your support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Cormick. Board members, any questions? Chess. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Next, uh, we will move on to the information action items of the agenda. Um, we have, uh, oh, Dr. Cormick is here to present the request to approve the rental agreement between two Mississippi museums and JPS. Good evening again. We are um, urging your support of the rental agreement between the two museums. This will be utilized, as uh, Dr. Green uh, referenced in his report. Uh, this week is Counselor's Appreciation Week, and we are utilizing the facility to host a Counselor Appreciation event. Um, the two museums space, the auditorium, they, uh, the space is conducive to that celebration, and we urge your support uh, for this rental. Great. Any questions, comments? Uh, hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. So moved. 
Second. Ms. Thompson, Mrs. Thompson has moved. Ms. Hooter seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Cormick. Next, we'll invite Dr. Evans uh, to present the request to approve the agreement with the International Baccalaureate Organization in the Jackson Public School District. Good evening to Dr. Green, school board president, school board members, and JPS family. The administration recommends the approval of the Memorandum of Understanding with the International Baccalaureate Organization and Jackson Public Schools to offer the International Baccalaureate Programming and District Professional Development in our district's IB authorized schools. While the district has offered an IB program since 1992, there is no record of an MOU that describes the requirements or expectations of our current partnership, so we wanted to codify those expectations. The purpose of this agreement is to support the current IBO authorized schools by defining expectations and clarifying fees. Approval of this agreement would also allow the district to offer professional development on the campuses of our IBO authorized schools. While conferences and trainings are offered all over the world are, and are extremely beneficial to networking and for the purpose of sharing best practices, this agreement would allow the IBO to come into our schools to provide, to provide professional development to larger populations of, student, of teachers, I'm sorry, at one time, and it would strengthen our IBO programs. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Board members, any questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Thank Evans. You. Uh, next, we'll invite Mrs. Marshall Thomas uh, to present uh, items C and D, uh, the approval to amend the agreement between the American College Testing, ACT, and JPS, and the uh, request to renew the agreement between Major Clarity and the Jackson Public School District. Great evening again. Um, the administration recommends amending the memorandum of understanding uh, between American College Testing, which is ACT, and Jackson Public Schools. Um, the amendment is being proposed to add additional funding for 10th and 12th grade students to have access to our ACT district testing. Our district is scheduled, um, if approved, to give um, the ACT to 10th and 12th graders on March 8th, 2023 in the district um, at all seven sites. Board, thank you, Mrs. Marshall Thomas. Board members, any questions or comments? I, I do have one question. So will this effectively um, allow us to create an ACT test taking experience that would be similar to if you went on a Saturday where all the classrooms in the school are taking the ACT? So this is very similar to the Saturday testing. What's unique is that our students can take the ACT during the regular school day at their regular school site. So, you know, they're comfortable with their teachers, they're comfortable um, being in their schools, and then they're also given during the regular school hours. That's great. Really what was behind my question is I've, I've heard feedback in the past where sometimes a test may be administered where students are in a cafeteria or, or you know, there's movement. No, know. so we, the, in our test on March 8th is district-wide. We start at the same time. They're in classrooms. Our ninth graders are engaged in our mastery prep. Um, ACT does not approve for ninth graders to take the district tests. And so this particular day, our 10th and 11th graders will be taking the national district test, while our 11th graders are taking the state ACT. So school-wide, um, all students will be engaged in some form of ACT. That's, that's wonderful. What about the plan test? I, I know there was some time when but ninth yep. graders did plan. And, and ACT, um, they did away with plan. So all of our students will, will be, be participating, yes, ma'am. Great. Any other questions on the ACT? If not, let's move on to major clarity. Okay. Um, the administration is recommending board approval of the contract between major clarity and the Jackson Public Schools 
for the purpose of providing a college and career readiness tool for students in sixth grade to manage the process of identifying and pursuing their post-secondary plans, including their academic pathway through high school and also electronic transcript submission for high school scholars. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Any questions, comments, board members? One of the questions I asked, which I think you answered, this is a this helps us um, meet MDE requirements for individual success plans. Is it that does. Correct? That's one. That's one of the benefits of having um, an online tool. Is it allows us to manage, monitor, and house our ISPs um, because our students are so transient when they move to a different school. Um, their their ISPs go along with them, but starting in sixth grade. Our students um, began their ISPs, and we can track and help monitor and support those students through 12th grades. What I did bring um, along tonight was a copy of our, um, it's a planning guide, and so it shows each grade level what activities our students are involved in with major clarity. And I think, Dr. Seebeck, this is just a tad bit different from what you have, but I did want to bring it so that everyone would have a copy of it. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Marsh Thomas. Great. You, you want to speak to what's in the guide? Yes, and, I can. Yeah. Everyone get a copy. And so what you'll see is a, um, it's kind of like a pacing guide, even starting in sixth grade. So each grade level is on its separate sheet. And so it also shows each year how added components are as the students matriculate and get closer to college, get closer to their post-secondary goals, how additional um, components are added. But even starting in sixth grade, which is what we are, we're requesting to add um, tonight, if you know, um, seventh through twelfth grade is, is provided by MDE. Um, we actually were the, were the first, was the first district in the state to actually um, use major clarity, but um, um, MDE actually um, added major clarity for all districts in the state of Mississippi this year. The only thing, it does not support sixth graders. And so sixth grade was part of our plan, and so we are requesting to have sixth grade added. So um, you see the tasks that are listed here. For example, a, a sixth grader will start their student onboarding and learning about the system. They'll take a personality assessment. They also will take a learning assessment. That's what they'll do the first term. And the resources to the links are listed there as well. And then the second nine weeks, they start their career exploration. So just imagine a sixth grader start thinking about and exploring careers. Mm -hmm. So that's why we thought it was really, really important that we added the sixth grade um, to the platform. This is excellent. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say, Barbara. <laughs> this is excellent. Is, is this uh, written for teachers? Yes, sir. Is there a possibility to share this and train parents on it? Yeah, that's, that's what I was great excited idea, Dr. about. Steve. Yes, sir. I think I, I, oh. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. confusion yeah. amongst parents around the purpose of major clarity. Um, I think it, the um, there's probably disparate communication around what it is and what it isn't across the district. And, and if there's a like just looking, I didn't know. Um, and, and, and so this had the same reaction board members had around the table. This is wonderful information. I think it would be advantageous to get it into the hands of parents and to provide, I, even if it's a webinar that parents could attend or engage. And maybe that happens already. It, it, and it does, and I just want to add it, but, but I do understand, I take your point. Um, it, and it, it differs from schools, and I'll just be honest with you. It probably depends on the, um, the comfort level of the counselors, the comfort level of those that are supporting parents um, as they're explaining this, because this is a part of the academic counseling sessions. So when a, a parent and a and, um, student goes in with a counselor for their fall or spring academic counseling session, this information should be covered um, in depth. 
But again, it does probably depend upon the, um, the comfort level of those presenting the information. Now that, and to be fair, as a parent who's not as engaged in those counseling <laughs> sessions, that may also explain why I may not have the, the knowledge level. So I'll, I'll take that as well. Um, well. I think that's a really important point, Dr. Sivak. I know it's difficult for parents. It was difficult for me when my children were in JPS to figure out what's the best thing for them to take when if mm -hmm. I wanted them to be able to go to college. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it caused me a lot of stress. Yeah. And that was back in the day. We had this tiny, big sheet of paper with tiny, tiny, I mean, it was a nightmare trying to figure out how to advise your child, your yes, children. Sir. Yes. So I think that's a key point to really make sure that parents understand yeah. this. Agree. Mm -hmm. And we can definitely do more. Around. I totally agree with them because I think even if from a parent's perspective, and especially sixth grade, I mean, I think that's where it begins really. That's where high school begins mm -hmm. to me. Uh, because in my mind, especially because of some of the courses you take, especially in seventh and eighth grade, that count in your high school right. credits. Mm -hmm. I think having this ahead of time and, and knowing what pathway you wanted to take and, and just even having an idea can help you streamline where you headed in your senior year. I mean, it's, this, is, this is called write the vision and make it plain. And in order for people to uh, be able to know where they're going, they got to see it. They got to see it. And so once they can see it and it's right here and it's in black and white and this plain and simple and parents can help them navigate through this, it would be really good along with the counselors. And I don't think I got this until I got to special programming. Um, and what I mean by now, all my kids went through all the, the counselors did, but they went, they kind of went over like what my child had already done mm -hmm. when I got there and not necessarily what my choices were for where they needed to go right. and what they needed to do ahead of time. And I say that because once we got into uh, early college high school, that's where it was where I met and it was like, okay, we need to make sure you're taking these courses, you're taking this, you're doing this so you can get here. And it makes a big difference. It just makes a big difference to have, have the parents involved with helping their children navigate where they need to go. Just want to one reflection on this. Um, you didn't say these words, but I wonder if your experience, um, Dr. Sivak, and perhaps yours as well, Mrs. Thompson, was that this was more a compliancy kind of um, uh, task or, or program or whatever. So, sure, while it you know helps us to fulfill a requirement with MDE, it, there's definitely the, you know we certainly have the belief that. This is a way for us to better manage something that's really could be super, super powerful across the board, let alone for those scholars who, you know, um, the pathway from wherever I am, sixth grade, 12th grade, to the career and the life that I want could be so, so fuzzy, right, but to any child. Um, so we certainly believe it can be helpful there. I do want to lift up, though, um, in honor of our counselors who are not here to speak to this, you know, their plates are really, really full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as we're thinking about team, as we're thinking about the engagement, briefing, education, whatever, of parents around this tool, and, and obviously the, keep, the, the continued efforts to develop our team members, we've also got to think about, you know, how we get to there the deepening understanding, the more strategic use of the tool, the continuous conversations with young people about the classes they're taking, their interests and opportunities that are out there, all those things, figuring out how that happens outside of that counseling mm -hmm. in addition to, to that counseling, counseling session. Because yes. that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. But that's what we have right now. I mean, we've got advisory as well, but, but, but this is the kind of thing that it just takes, it's iterative, right. as all of you as parents know. And so we just, we need to keep thinking about how we support families in, in engaging with this more than just, what do you want to go? Oh, well, you need to take a science class or whatever. Great. 
And um, so our scholars also, um, now our scholars interact with Major Clarity often. If you notice that um, the pacing guide that's listed, that's actually not done by the counselors. That's done either in their CCR classes, is done for ninth graders, is done in their STEM class, 10th graders is done in their history class, and in 11th graders is done in English 3, and 12th graders in CCR and their English classes. So the teachers also have a real, um, uh, uh, an integral um, role in ensuring that the scholars are constantly engaging in, in major clarity. Got it. Mm -hmm. And just to add, major clarity has over 30,000 scholarships that they uh, embed in the platform that our students have access to as they are applying for colleges, and it sends it directly to um, those entities, as well as the Common App where they have access to apply to over 1,000 colleges at one time. Awesome. That's worth the price right there. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. In my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions, comments? If not, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Ms. Figures a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Marshall Thomas. Uh, next, we will go on to the request to approve the agreement between Smart Therapy and the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Bingham Gibbs will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Board President, Board Members, Dr. Green. The Office of Exceptional Education Services is presenting for information action a service agreement with Smart Therapy LLC to provide physical therapy services for students with disabilities in the Jackson Public School District. The Jackson Public School District is seeking these services in accordance with the Individuals with Disability Education Act for eligible students aged 3 through 21 to offer excellent services to meet their unique needs. Thank you, Dr. Bingham Gibbs. Board members, any questions, comments? If not, are there any, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Bingham Gibbs. Next, we'll invite Attorney Moore up to present items F and G. This is the request to approve the Legacy Scholar Supplemental Grant Agreement with the Equal Justice Initiative, first with Forest Hill High School and second with the Career Development Center. Good evening. Good evening. Board members, board president, President and Dr. Sebag, Dr. Green. The Office of the General Counsel recommends that the Jackson Public School District's Board of Trustees approve the grant agreement between the Equal Justice Initiative and Jackson Public School District on behalf of Forest Hill High School. Now this one is a supplemental agreement. The original agreement was entered into on September the 2nd of 2022, and the school found that upon trying to coordinate the trip, that they didn't have enough funds to cover the transportation, so they were awarded a supplemental grant to cover that cost. That's what this first one is for. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Board members, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Ms. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Attorney Moore. Uh, next, we have the request to approve the 16th section lease agreement between Layton. That was the first one. Nice. Oh, I thought we would take them both, but I'm let's. Sorry. It, it were two that's times. right. One's a supplemental. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's that's our attorney making sure we we're straight. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, I'll, I'll go attorney quick. Moore. <laughs> um, so the general counsel is recommending that the board of trustees approve the grant agreement between EJI and uh, the school district on behalf of CDC. CDC is getting awarded a new grant for to take a, a new group of scholars to visit the museum. Um, that grant amount is award is an amount of four thousand eight hundred and ten dollars, and they will be taking their scholars to visit the museum on March the tenth, twenty twenty three. I have a question, not about this because it's wonderful, but do we have any feedback from the scholars on the trips that they've taken so far? Hmm. I'm not sure. Is Marshall Thomas, do you know? We can get that feedback for you and bring it back to you at the next board meeting. I, I would love to hear from some of them about what that experience is like. Awesome. Why don't you come on to the mic? <laughs> oh, you went. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
She thought it was a different trip. Uh, that is all right. Good. We want to hear about that one too. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am Ashley Molden, and I serve the Early College High School program as the principal. Um, our students really enjoyed the trip. They were really moved by the exhibits that they saw there. I was kind of jealous that I was unable to go. <laughs> but I do know that they did come back and have a lot of rich discussion about the things that they saw. And they were that was the biggest thing. They were really emotionally moved, you know, by the things that they saw on display at the museum. Mm, Thank you. And, and maybe we could invite Ms. Marshall Thomas. Maybe we could get a couple students to just I would love share that. their experience. Because, you know, like, they don't even, like, like, there's no videotaping or nothing. So it's like nothing on the Internet that lets you know what it is. You only can hear by word of mouth, like, what happens in there. So I would love to hear from the students about what they saw in there. I, and I'm going to y'all, so. <laughs> Me too. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, I so move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mrs. Thompson has moved. Ms. Hilliard second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Moore. Uh, next, we have the request to approve the 16th section lease agreement between Layton J. Smith, SS, S and S Apache, and the Jackson Public School District. Mr. Burke. Uh, President Seebeck. Uh, Superintendent Green Board. Uh, the administration requests the Boards of Trustees approval for the 16th section lease renewal agreement between Jackson Public School District and Layton J. Smith for the property at 1820 Terry Road, identified as parcel, uh, tax parcel 201, 201, 87, 201, 130, and 201, 132. Uh, this request will allow this lessee, which is uh, SNS Apache, which was founded in 1964. It is the oldest um, RV dealership and has grown to be Central Mississippi's premier R RV dealership. With over 50 years of experience in RV industry, they have a selection of new and used RVs for your purchasing pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh this, lease, <laughs> this lease agreement is being executed for one year and will expire at noon on December 1st, 2023. The property has been appraised as of September 30th, 2019. The annual amount of the lease agreement is $12,500, which the lease uh, has been paid through April, was paid for April uh, 2022. The property will be appraised every five years with the next appraisal date uh, occurring September 30th, 2024. The reason why the lease is for one year is that the owner is owned up in years and he has not decided if he is going to continue business after this, this year. So he's asked to be on a one a year to year lease. So we will revisit this at some point prior to the uh, anniversary to determine whether it's going to be a, an extension. All right. Thank you, Mr. Burke. All Any right. questions, board members, comments? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item finance. All of the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda finance? So moved. Second. Dr. Hairston is moved. Mr. Figures is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item general. All of the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda for general items? So move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Ms. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item personnel. All consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Uh, we do have an item for executive session. Is there a motion to close the uh, general session to uh, consider an executive session? 
Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Mrs. Thompson has second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. COVID-19, but you did it. You showed the world your resilience through an ice storm in 2021 that impacted water lines and in 22 water lines that dried up when failed infrastructure gave up. And so you recommitted your minds to what was possible, learning and building an emotional intelligence that is required not only for tomorrow, but to be the leaders in your schools and communities that you are today. And so we do not shy away from the fact that some of your friends and loved ones during a time of heightened gun violence may have caught one. But instead of running scared, you became the Superman on your street, on your block, in your sub, who declares to other youth that we must be each, we must be as a district, we must be as a city and a state more responsible and committed to social justice issues 